Thank you so much for having me. It's, it's a real honor uh, to be here and to feel the energy. And uh, for a long time, as uh, I'm sure it's with a lot of young farmers, when we just started out, we felt quite isolated. So it's really exciting to see this uh, local food movement and understanding the role of, of uh, farms and climate change uh, uh, all over the world. So it's, it really is a pleasure, and I'm, and I'm really honored to be here. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, our little piece of land in southern New Hampshire. I was fortunate enough to grow up on an uh, organic farm. My uh, uh, father studied agriculture at Cornell when organic was a dirty word, as he used to say. Uh, but they stuck, they stuck with it. Our approach to agriculture in the last 40 years has changed radically. And so what I, I'm going to talk about is what that's meant for our little farm going from uh, where I'd say uh, a do no harm, uh, you know, we're, we're focusing on sustainability uh, to really focusing on what happens when we actively manage and try to take carbon out of the atmosphere and put it in the soil and uh, focus instead of this goal of simple sustainability, looking at a higher level of sustainability of resilience and health and abundance. This farm was uh, uh, largely hay and timber and was more of like a homestead. And it was productive and it supported my, uh, my family and four siblings, but it wasn't something that we, as uh, me and my uh, siblings, could come back to easily and support a larger, uh, a larger family. Um, and so we had all more or less headed our own way. And in 2003, if you recall, uh, it was a, it was a it was a boom time. It was a development uh, frenzy around where we are, and the gangsters of the world were, were riding high. And we had the, uh, the farm adjacent to us, uh, which had been in the same family uh, since 1719, uh, came up for sale. And we, we heard on a Wednesday that the next Monday it was going to be listed. And we had to come up with an offer. Uh, by then, if we were interested in, uh, uh, in not having 60 houses show up. It was a big change. I was, uh, as, as I say, uh, not on the farm. I, was, I, I look back, I, I was in the belly of the beast <laughs> elsewhere, off the farm in, in Hong Kong, actually. Um, and so this was a big change because something had to happen. And so, but what happened was, was incredible. It brought our community together and in the process of putting, of being able to purchase this farm with conservation easements, we also put conservation easements on our own farm and nine other properties in that town. We now have 25% of our whole town under agricultural easements. And that all happened in this, in this instance. And so, with this incredible showing of support, this was also the beginning of this, this movement around people caring about not just you know, their property taxes going up with new school kids coming in, but also where their food came, uh, comes from. This was just starting. There wasn't a market uh, uh, much before this. So, but with this incredible support and rallying around the idea and importance of of uh, productive lands, it was profound, had a profound effect on me. Um, and within, in 2003, my, I, I, you know, we added a farm, I got married, uh, you know, everything was changing very quickly. Uh, but what was really important, and I had such a strong feeling that we needed, we had a responsibility to, with this land to not just hold it and preserve it, to make it productive. And so we started as a family looking at what, what can we do with this resource? And we started looking more, because we have this sense in New Hampshire. Uh, this is a map, by the way, of, of New Hampshire, and those are all agricultural soils. But if you know anything about agriculture in the Northeast, very little food is produced there right now. New Hampshire produces less than 5% of its own food, and yet we spend $3 billion a year on food. 
we spend $5 million a year on energy, importing it. And yet, and produce, again, only 3 to 5% of our own energy. And yet, we are one of the most forested states in the country. We heat with, 60% of all the households heat with uh, heating oil, imported. It's, it's incredible. Um, and if you look here, right now there are only 3,000 farmers in 5.7 million acres. And like you said, we're not producing a lot of food. But we look, we've got 40 inches of rain, and I'll show you some of our, our, our soil. We've got population centers. We're an hour from Boston, we're an hour from Concord, we're an hour from Portland, Maine. We're four hours from New York City. And yet, the predominant agricultural attitude is that you can't grow it here, everybody goes out west, it just doesn't work. So it required a lot of sort of a little bit of gumption and all of this, this demand for local food to start to overcome that and to look at our actual natural resources. And so here's some basic calculations looking at, you know, we have about 138,000 acres of cropland total. When in 1830s, most of this land was actually cleared. There were more sheep in two towns during that time than there are in all of New England today. So this is land that, and now th this was not properly managed. I mean, th th there was incredible environmental degradation during the agricultural boom. But, but we knew that production was possible. And so I was especially interested in, in what other crops to, to really could be productive on this landscape to provide a whole diet. And so started looking at grains and oils. I was especially interested also in, in, this, in becoming more energy independent and, and focusing on, on how we could make this a profitable enterprise. So as you can see, only 40,000 acres would be required a third of our current crop rotation if we put our, that land into crop rotation, would feed all 1.3 million people in the state. And so we, we went through a transition from an awakening of the land and focusing on the biological systems and focusing on how we could reduce inputs and, and we did a lot of reading uh, and, and outreach to people all over, the, all, all over the, the state and really looking outside the state where uh, a lot of work was being done especially in Pennsylvania with Rodale Institute and some independent folks and reading you know, Acres Magazine and everything else. Um, and so we went from a hay system, ex as you've heard with Jim Garrish, exporting a lot of our nutrients, but, but being able to basically bump along to really trying to invest in our soils and use the same land but get a lot more out of it. And, and by focusing on those biological systems, be able to increase the output while we re reduce our inputs and, uh, and create what we ho hoped would be a profitable enterprise. So now, we are, uh, through this awakening of the, of the land, we now produce uh, wheat, spring and winter. We produce triticale and winter rye and canola and sunflower. And we've added high tunnels for winter greens with garlic, ginger, okra. Uh, added a dairy operation. We've added animals. We've uh, uh, so we have pork sausage, I mean, it, the list goes on and on. And in the process, as we add more and we add more layers, they complement one another and we close these loops and we're able to bring my, uh, not only providing uh, a life for myself and my son and my, and my wife, but also now my sister and her husband and, and uh, probably half a dozen other folks who have related enterprises. We don't hire employees, but we build enterprises on top of one another. So we added animals. They were critical to bringing this land back. And again, the high tunnels, incredible technology if you're not familiar with it retains moisture during the winter. It all evaporates back in. That's snow along, along there. 
and yet this is producing now and it will be about a month where it slows down in the middle of the winter but we'll have winter greens, uh, kale and spinach and, and broccoli all winter and then these high tunnels transform into uh, season extending crops for hot summer crops so this is where we can grow things like the ginger and the okra. And if you haven't had winter greens, it's a completely different thing. This is my three-year-old son, and I mean, it was just a, an amazing thing last year, you p picking and eating the spinach like it's candy. He says, it's so sweet. So in this, this is, you know, there hadn't been grains grown in New Hampshire since around the Civil War before the sickle bar mower was invented. By the time that the technology, combine technology came around, all this kind of uh, work had moved west, and there was just the, 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 the feeling that you just can't do that here. And yet we're, we're getting, you know, two, two ton yields, I mean, without a problem. And I think we can go quite a bit more as we start managing our fertility. This is garlic. Uh, 